This morning, our scripture passage is from the Gospel according to Luke, verses 13 through 35. I'm going to split the reading this morning into two sections. We'll start with verses 13 through 27, and then a little later on, we're going to finish up with 28 through 35. Please hear the word of the Lord. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing as you walking along the way? And they stood still, their faces downcast. And Cleopas responded, Are you the only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they did not find his body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went in the tomb and found it, just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Gracious Father, we are just two weeks past that glorious Easter morning, but we're still in the Easter season. So let the Holy Spirit come. Let him touch us. Let him move us closer to you, Lord, as we study your scripture this morning. And we ask this all in the name of your precious Son, our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. So how many of you have found yourself hoping for something to come to pass, and, and then it doesn't, and so maybe you're disappointed. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of disappointment you feel that when, at the end of the day, you really like to have a treat. And so you go to the cupboard, and someone ate that last cookie, piece of pie, or ding-dong. No, it's not that kind of disappointment. And it's not the disappointment you feel when your favorite sports team loses that big game, maybe kind of like, oh, I don't know, when UCLA beat USC. <laughs> that was for you. <laughs> no, not that kind of disappointment either. I'm talking about that crushing disappointment when something you hoped for, maybe even prayed for, Maybe it's something like a recovery from an illness or a sickness. Maybe it's about a relationship or a child that's heading to trouble. And then it doesn't work out. There is no recovery. There's no healing. The relationship is not mended, and the child gets into trouble. What do you do when that happens in life? Now, I want you to hold on to that for just a moment as we examine our gospel story, a story that's probably pretty familiar to us, but a story only found in Luke. So we might ask, well, why did Luke include this parochopy? I think because it's not just a story of two disciples. It's a story about us. The theme we find in this gospel story is a theme we find in our lives. What do we do when our dreams and our hopes are crushed. But today's story is also a story about hope. 
It's a story that will become our story when we rethink what the resurrection means to each one of us. But let's begin by recapping what happened just prior to this passage of these two disciples on their road to Emmaus. It is the third day since Jesus' crucifixion, and three of the women had gone to the tomb, and they find it empty. Mary Magdalene has this vision of angels, and they tell her, well, hey, Jesus is risen from the dead. So she races back to tell the disciples. Now, if you look at the different gospel stories, you'll find that their reaction to this news is mixed. Some dismiss the women. This is women's idle chatter. But some are curious. Peter runs to the tomb. He looks in. He finds it empty, and he's amazed. But at this point in our story, we don't really know what Peter is thinking. But it seems clear that these two disciples, these men walking on the road to Emmaus, they're doubting, they're disappointed, their hope was crushed. And so they decide to leave Jerusalem, probably heading towards home, and possibly thinking all about what had happened. So this is where we pick up our story. Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem. It's not a terribly long walk. And as they walk along, they're discussing what happened. Now, I want you to note here that in Greek, this verb discussing in this context isn't a casual conversation. It's not like they're going, wow, remember when Jesus took those demons and he, they went in the pigs, and then those pigs went over the cliff? <laughs> I bet they were really surprised. It's more like a questioning, an examining, a reasoning together. I think we can infer these two individuals are trying to figure something out, something that they hoped for versus what they think really happened. And as they're walking along the way, Jesus approaches, but they're kept from recognizing him. For some reason, and we don't know because Luke doesn't tell us, they're blinded in a way. Maybe it's their doubts and fears. Maybe Jesus just wants to hear their version of the story. We don't really know. But what we do know is Jesus asked them a simple question. What are you discussing as you walk along the way? And they both stop walking. They stand still. Their faces are downcast. Some translations say sad. And Cleopas responds, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem that doesn't know what has happened there in these days? Now, if this was today... I think the response would go something like this. Seriously? What have you been, under a rock? Well, <laughs> it's, it's been all over the 24-hour news station. It's all over the Internet. And you know that archaic thing called the newspaper? It's in there as well. Seriously. They're obviously surprised that this man is not in the know, so to speak. So why is Jesus asking the question? Because obviously he knows what happened. He went through it. It was Jesus who was scourged, beaten, whipped, had that crown of thorns shoved brutally on his head, carried a heavy cross, and died a horrific death by crucifixion. Of course he knows. But he asks a simple little question, what things? And Luke tells us now that they both reply. So now they're speaking together, you know, talking over each other. Well, let me tell you, this man, this Jesus, he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed. And he was handed over by his own people to be crucified. And then they say three little words that I think convey a significant theme in this passage. We had hoped. We had hoped. We had hoped this man was the Messiah. We had hoped he would save us from the Romans. We had hoped 
he would redeem all Israel. We had hoped. This ordinary little verb, hoped, in the Greek translation, it's used in a tense called the imperfect. And this tells us that it's a continuous action verb. But because it has another little twist to it, something, you can get a little Greek lesson here, called a temporal augment, we know that that action is flowing from the past. So the question then is, are they still hoping? Doesn't appear to be, does it? Remember how they looked when he asked them the question? They stopped. They stood still. Their faces were downcast. They had hoped, and now they're disappointed. Perhaps it's that crushing disappointment I asked you to recall earlier. This is us. Isn't this us? We have hope in our lives for certain outcomes. And sometimes we find ourselves on our own road to Emmaus, trying to make sense of things that don't work out. We prayed for healing, and none came. We prayed for that job that marriage, that relationship, that child, and it doesn't work out. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we might feel alone, betrayed, abandoned, maybe without hope. We're just like Cleopas and his companion, and I think we can understand why they had not recognized their risen Lord. They were so knee-deep in their disappointment Appointment. They didn't expect to ever see Jesus again. And so when he walked beside them, they failed to recognize him. But they stop, and they explain, and after a while Jesus listens, and he says, Stop. How foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Now, if Jesus had stopped there, and I was Cleopas, I think I'd be a little taken back by that, maybe even a little hurt. But Jesus doesn't stop there, does he? He spends the remainder of the walk explaining to them everything about himself that's found in the scriptures, starting with Moses, going through the prophets. And the whole sweep of the Old Testament story is about the redemption of humanity. So I think this might have taken some time, probably a bit of time. And in fact, as we read a little further on, we know that the day is drawing to a close and evening is drawing near. Now listen to the remainder of our story. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and began to give it to them, and their eyes were opened, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were our hearts not burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled, saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and he has appeared to Simon. And then the two of them had told what happened on the way and how when Jesus was recognized by them, when he broke the bread. It's interesting, isn't it? Now these two disciples are eager for Jesus to say. They still haven't recognized him, though. They spent all day with him. But there's something, something about this man, and so they compel him to stay. And now what does Jesus do? Remember, they invited him to stay, but now he acts as the host. He goes in, and he breaks the bread, and gives a blessing, and it's at that very moment that the disciples' eyes are open and he vanishes from their sight. Maybe it's the familiarity of the breaking of the bread and the blessing 
Maybe it's a supernatural event. All we know is after a long day's journey on their road to Emmaus, they finally see their risen Lord. Now, they don't weep and wail when he's gone. What do they do? They pack it all up. They hightail it back to Jerusalem at night in the dark because they're so excited. They want to share the good news, the evangelion. Jesus has risen as he promised. Their hope is true. It's a happy ending, isn't it? But where does it leave us if we're still walking on our own road to Emmaus? If we're still feeling overwhelmed, disappointed, without hope, I think we can turn to this story and insert our name. Remember, it said Cleopas and the other. It's Cleopas and Vanessa. It's Cleopas and Christina. It's Cleopas and it's you. Jesus is walking with us. He is on our road to Emmaus with us, right beside us waiting to show us the way, waiting, waiting to open our eyes so that we'll recognize him, waiting to break bread with us, waiting to show us his love, his mercy, and his grace. I think Luke included this story so we would have a pattern to remember. Life will at times be hard, and we'll feel that weight a crushing disappointment. We'll feel alone, maybe even hopeless. But when we're in that dark place, on that long road that seems to stretch endlessly before us, we need to remember this story because it's our story. Brothers and sisters, Christ's gracious gift of love and mercy, it's big enough to sustain your hope when you can't sustain it anymore. It's big enough to carry your burden when you can't walk another step. It's big enough to open your eyes so that you can recognize the risen Lord. Jesus does more. He does more than lead us to the cross. He leads us through the cross to the resurrection to a hope that endures, to a journey with eyes open wide. Jesus walks with us and leads us to his hope, the resurrection hope, my hope, your hope. And in doing so, he helps us make sense of our life, a life that should be grounded in our eternal hope, that resurrection hope, that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.